Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, mine website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. This week's Talking Business is brought to you by multi-award winning law firm McDonald Legal, experts in the areas of dispute resolution and commercial and property law. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from our website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number nine in our series for 2023, and today's date is Friday, March 31st. First, I'll be talking to Dr. Vincent Cantrinata, health expert and founder of Renovatio Bioscience, one of the country's fastest growing health and wellness brands, renovatio.com.au. Dr. Vincent is a food scientist, clinical nutritionist, researcher and health and wellness expert. And I'll be talking to Rabobank Bank economist Mike Levery about how the Chinese economy is going with the reopening. But now let's talk to Dr. Vincent Cantuanata. Dr. Vincent, tell us about Immunity Plus. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Immunity Plus is our latest product that we launched in 1,000 Wool- 1, supermarkets under Woolworths because what we saw after last year, people actually are very interested in making sure that their immune health is in the tip-top shape. And not only that, I think we did a little bit of a, of a survey and a research, a mini research in terms of consumer behavior and how they consume information online for the very first time after the pandemic, or I should say during the pandemic, for the very first time, people are interested in health information without the vanity aspect. So before the pandemic, when people search for healthy diet or healthy lifestyle, majority of the time it is being attached with the purpose of how to lose 10 pounds in 10 days or how to detox to lose weight how to be skinny or things like that but for the very first time because they have more time i guess in on their hand as well as they are more interested in finding out how to make sure that them and their family stay stay healthy they they gain better understanding on how our immune system works we have a very very active uh, facebook community facebook page community and what we hear from them is that they learn the, the, the term boosting immunity or boosting immune system is actually a, not a scientific term because when you boost your immune system, it's actually really bad for your body because it can cause autoimmune disease and stuff like that. What you want to do is to make sure that your body is healthy to fight off diseases. And when we look at the market, it's very interesting that majority of immune support supplement only address the symptoms, so runny nose or sore throat. Whereas as a scientist, you know that 70% of your immune system originates from your gut health. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to address the immune system aspect as well as the inflammation aspect. Because a lot of people, they understand that you can fall sick from viral or bacterial infection, but not a lot of people know that Inflammation is the root cause of majority of the disease that we experience. Uh, Dr. Vincent, you're a food scientist and also a clinical nutritionist. Yes. And so what exactly do you put into Immunity Plus that makes it so exceptional? So we have four ingredients in our (laughs) formulation. The first one is our activated phenolics, which is a group of phenolic antioxidants that that have been extracted and activated using the patented technology that I invented during my PhD research at the University of Newcastle. And this technology enable our body to absorb up to 97% of these phenolic antioxidants, which a lot of people think that 97% is not a really big number. However, compared to the 3 to 5% of the conventional technology, this allows our body to utilize this holy grail of antioxidants much, much more effectively and efficiently. And on top of that, we also have quercetin in our formulation, which is a very unique phenolic that helps our body to increase the resilience of our, of, of our cells. Our body is made up of trillions of cells. And when you take care of the health of the the cells, it it makes our body healthy because at the cellular level, when the cell system can function properly, the result is that your organ, your system organ, and eventually your body can function well. The third one is zinc and the fourth one is vitamin C. We put zinc and vitamin C to work synergistically with both the activated phenolics as well as quercetin 
and that completes the immune support to not to boost your immune system because that's the wrong term, but to make sure that your immune system works properly. And we call that in science, we call that a homeostatic state. So homeostasis, it means that your body is functioning properly and can respond properly to things, for example, infection or inflammation. And you've got it now selling at Woolworths. Yes. So we launched earlier this month and the response has been very, very positive. We are we, we are entering a, a new cycle of production because I guess one thing that I learned since launching our first two products in Woolworths in the middle of pandemic is that we need to make sure that we can fulfill the demand of, of the customers. And not only that, it also is... Perhaps from a personal perspective, this is a testament to how working synergistically with our supply partner uh, is very important. We are we are proudly supported and and supporting Australian apple farmers because uh, I personally have worked with them from the research stage from 2010, and it makes me really proud that I can showcase the the goodness and the, the, the highest quality uh, of Australian apples for the Immunity Plus, but uh, two of our other hero products, which is the Activated Phenolics Powder and the An Apple A Day Tablet. And uh, so who are your suppliers? So we work, we, we work together with Australian Apple Farmers Cooperative. So they are, they are our main suppliers for our apples because the Activated Phenolics uh, ingredients, it's made from 100% Australian apples. And throughout our throughout our supply chain, we make sure that we stay true to our commitment. We always say that we have always been and will always be 100% Australian made and grown. So how do you find it uh, in terms of working with a supermarket? I mean, how's it, has it gone down? I, I can only speak for from my own experience, from our own experience, experience with working with Woolworths. I have to say that in this particular case, they are very nurturing and very collaborative because as a small company, hopefully we'll grow very soon to not, on, to not just be the small company, but as a small company, we have limitation in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience launching with the biggest supermarket chain in, in, in the country. But the support that they have given us and continue to give us in terms of logistic, in terms of a warehousing, in terms of uh, fulfilling demand have been just phenomenal. And it also shows that the spirit of collaborative, because we have we have this very strong collaborative spirit uh, in, in our research team when I was an academic at the University of Newcastle. I'm very, very happy that my experience as, as an academic can is applicable to to the to the retail giant. And we have just been very, very fortunate to have a really good partner in terms of achieving our dream as a company and my personal dream, because I feel that they understand what I'm trying to achieve in terms of uh, using my research to make a change, a positive change in people's life in the way that they are healthier and happier. And they took what I wanted to achieve and helped me to amplify it and reach more people. In, in terms of uh, the, the body's immune system, I mean, your system is actually helping your body work properly rather than that, supplementing. That is, that is correct. So what we are trying to do is uh, at, the, at, at its very core is to reduce our body inflammation rate. So when you reduce our body inflammation rate, it really alleviates a lot of pressure in our on our body system. And one of the reasons why our body can't respond properly to say, for example, the chance of infection or, uh, or, or recovery is because our body is too busy taking care of, of of inflammation. So if we if we give help to our body to fight off inflammations, it means that we are we're giving our body a much better chance to do what they're supposed to do uh, efficiently. Now you've just started with Woolworths, so you don't have any initial idea of how much how you're going with sales or anything like that. Maybe not from from the new product, but from our two uh, existing products in Woolworths that was I think we're doing pretty pretty well because as you I mean you're uh, you're a business expert, Leon. So I think you know how 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 competitive a retail environment is, and usually a lot of new products or a lot of new lines do not survive their first cycle of review in, in, in this environment. And not only we survived the first cycle of review our first year, we also add a new product to our line. And uh, we are one of their best selling new product uh, in, in, in our category. And to do that during the pandemic, I think it's, a, it's not a testament of how great 
we are, but it is a testament on how positively the customers respond to our product. And the reason why they do that is because the product works for them and they have really good experience with, with our product. And one thing that I really learned from, from this experience is that when, when people have positive experience with health supplement with our product not only they come back and buy more they actually tell their friends and family and this is how we remain in business and keep on growing because our product works and product that works people want to share that information because if it makes them healthier it make if it makes them move without pain and freely get them get them moving get them active obviously they want to share this piece of information and i think this is the main reason why we are doing well in this environment well dr vincent that's fascinating stuff and thank you very much for your time thank you so much thanks for having me and now let's talk to rabobank economist michael Ebery. well michael uh, how have you rated the chinese economy with the reopening well If you look at what we've seen so far, there was an initial little mini bang, and then things appear to have gone rather flat, which isn't a total surprise, because unlike in the West, where during COVID, everybody got very generous stimulus checks from the government and businesses were propped up, uh, in China's case, everyone was left to fend for themselves, pretty much. And the subsidies that we did see went for supply, i.e. helping to flood the world with more Chinese exports, rather than into into demand. So even though you did see... Uh, as some analysts were flagging, a big buildup in Chinese retail bank deposits above and beyond the normal trend during COVID because there was nothing to spend it on. You haven't seen that really extensive burst of kind of COVID style revenge spending, which people had hoped to see. And while the recent data this week were better than nothing, they're not really particularly impressive. They don't suggest that you're going to have a sustained endogenous recovery, at least not without much, much more help from the central government, which is a, a very interesting question in and of itself. And of course, you've had a whole lot of political development since we last spoke with Xi Jinping. We have, and we've had more, even more recently than uh, than anything I, I, I've written about. In the, just overnight, we've had confirmation of rumours that we'd heard, which you know one can become very technical and nitty gritty about in terms of which particular party acronym or state apparatus, which committee, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has been shifted around left, right, and centre. The long and the short of it is that power has been concentrated much more in the hands of the CCP rather than in the ostensible state apparatus, which was running China largely up until now, with the CCP being the political arm, if you will. It's now much more focused on the CCP, much more on the CCP's central committee, and much more in the hands of Xi Jinping. So you do have a whole new team running the place. And I'm exaggerating only slightly to say, basically, it's one man deciding everything. And it's uh, and so it's become much more centralised. Well, yeah, they, you can't get much more centralised than one man deciding everything. Uh, and that guy, regardless of what any of the technocrats that he appoints say in English or in Chinese, continues to speak loudly about the importance of common prosperity, which, of course, roiled markets so much recently. And to just give you, you know, a few key pointers, just in the past couple of days, we had Yi Gang, the reappointed China, sorry, People's Bank of China central governor, central bank governor, whose reappointment was warmly welcomed by Marcus because he's seen as a technocrat. She and he have a chat. And lo and behold, Yi Gang comes out with a statement saying the PBC, PBOC's primary function is to completely support the government and CCP, which of course it is. But secondarily, it's absolutely to support them in their quote unquote struggle, which is a word with you know serious connotations in, in the Chinese political context against US containment. And as I said at the time, you know, uh, to my colleagues, imagine if that was reversed. Imagine if Jay Powell met President Biden and Powell said, it's our number one duty to support Biden. It's our number two duty to support the U.S. economy however we can in its struggle against China. You know, markets would go haywire at the implications of what that might mean. So that's one thing. And then just in the past 24 hours, we had all Chinese pricing for their $21 trillion bond market halted for national security reasons. Everyone was having to trade just over their mobile phones pretty inefficient. Some of that's come back online again today as we're talking. Uh, But now the stats services and all economic data from China outside China have been shut off. You can't get them. But at the same time, you've got a shrinking exports and weakness in the property sector in China. You've got a a, a timorous recovery in property from a very low base, which has to be flagged because, you know, it was so bad, you can always get a little tiny dead cat bounce, a a dead kitten bounce, we could call it. But yeah, you've got shrinking exports and you've got a a wobbly property sector that won't improve unless you absolutely re-blow that bubble, which runs totally counter to common prosperity, as I 
emphasized again and again in recent years. So how do you square that circle? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, so power is being centralized in Xi. She's talking about common prosperity, which is to use other Western terminology, leveling, leveling up, building back better, making sure the poor and other regions that haven't done as well as Shanghai and Beijing uh, and, and uh, the Pearl River Delta don't get left behind. But he's doing that without any real growth engines anymore. So how, how do you level up when you don't have any growth to tap into? It's, it's unclear where we go from here. And a number of pessimists, or let's say public pessimists on China, compared to how many there were a few years ago when it was basically me and a handful of others, is growing exponentially, where people realize that it's going to be very, very hard. And that's even before you get to the geopolitical angle of it, where we are talking about China openly accusing the US and Australia, by the way, of encircling it and containing it. And, and arguing that the likes of AUKUS, for example, are dangerous steps, not in our geopolitical interest, which lead us down very dangerous paths. <laughs> this is not a great environment in which to be trying to look at things as a neutral economist or a market analyst. And this is despite the Albanese government easing relations with China in terms of exports and tariffs, but uh, the AUKUS arrangement would complicate it, wouldn't it? Well, the AUKUS deal was always going to. But then, you know, obviously there's a very vociferous debate within Australia itself between current and former prime ministers over what one should or shouldn't do. And it's not my role here to, to speak to that. But I think those tensions were always going to reemerge. And it's, it's a welcome sign that there's been some, you know, tentative partial normalization. And it goes to show that possibly you can have geopolitical tensions and some trade normalization for a while. But I stress for a while because the language that's being used and the talk of struggle in particular, and centralization and common prosperity, and the fact that China's also talking about the need to rebuild its iron food bowl and that you can't actually have complete national sovereignty and control of your future if you don't control everything to do with food, which historically is true, by the way. None of that points to this being the you know free love, free hugs, free trade world that we used to think it was. And I think Australia is now fully cognizant of that. And that's why you're in AUKUS. Okay. And those tensions will be continued for quite some, quite a few years, I would imagine. I don't see how they change. I, I, I cannot see on the horizon the dynamic which points to that going back to the way things were. Uh, in fact, in, you know, to quote an Australian paper, when you look at the amount that Australia is now pledged to spend on AUKUS, it's not peacetime spending. It's wartime spending that you've pledged to spend. And that's just on submarines, which, you know, from a national security perspective are vital. Imagine if you had to do that into the Air Force and into the broader Navy and into the Army and into et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you'd be talking about wartime spending. Um, and, you know, for people who only want to focus on how much their house price is going to go up next year, it's pretty difficult to focus on. But I'm afraid uh, that's what the Australian establishment is going to have to. And uh, irrespective of the budgetary considerations of the money spent on AUKUS, well, we're already seeing, if you look at financial markets and the, the really dizzying developments in America and in Europe, and in fact, you know, globally after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, we're already seeing something that I've been flagging as a hypothetical for quite some time. And it was uh, another one of those, you know, pat him on the head and call him a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist kind of views, which then came to fruition, which is if we're going to keep hiking rates, ultimately, we're going to have to keep hiking rates and put liquidity into the economy at the same time rather than just withdrawing it. And what we've seen with SVB, Signature Bank, and some others uh, is not necessarily uh, a one-to-one -one with rate hikes and monetary policy easing at the same time, but it's certainly liquidity injections, potentially on a very large scale, watering down of mark-to-market -market rules with really big long-run impacts, by the way. Um, people aren't getting their head around how big that particular technical change is to, to US banking rules. And that all happening alongside higher interest rates. So you know, to pivot down to Australia just for a moment, after some of the data of late, people have been saying once again, well, phew, everything that happened in, you know, in Silicon Valley means that the RBA won't have to raise rates as high as we thought they were going to, and all's good down here. Well, I don't, I don't buy that. You actually you look at what's going on in America, I think the argument is for even higher interest rates than people think. And the recent labor force number in Australia was strong enough that, again, it completely backs the bank having to keep doing more. And if that means it has to inject liquidity some other way, it'll be interesting to see what, what creative device it can use to come up with it, because they don't have the excuse of doing it to try and prop up national security, only the housing market. And that's a much more problematic sell to a voting public. Well, that actually creates a number of interesting issues. I mean, uh, you know, on one hand, you, I mean, you've got three banks going down in America and Credit Suisse is only kept up because of the Swiss government. So you've got that, you've got the prospect of another 2008 
financial crisis uh, to the layman. And, uh, but you've got the higher inflation. So it puts central banks in a very, very difficult position. They're in an impossible position, really, and they're going to have to make some very, very bad choices soon. And whichever path they choose, it will hurt. But the one I would like to stress is that most market analysts say, well, we've now got a choice between financial stability and inflation. There's a trade-off. If we fight inflation, we destroy financial stability. If we support financial stability, we'll end up with higher entrenched inflation. I think there is a, a great deal of truth to that, but it actually doesn't capture the full spectrum of the problem, which is we have to go to the heart of the system, which is the American system. And America has got a trilemma, not a dilemma. They've got financial stability versus inflation versus national security. And national security, of course, is the role of the US dollar internationally, which Australia is completely part and parcel of, even though you have your own currency. Now that you've signed up to AUKUS, you know, you're in the Anglosphere, your role in foreign policy will be to prop up uh, or support or maybe even expand, you know, that circle uh, of where the dollar still runs true. And if they cut rates to try and support financial stability, even if that were to then say mean higher inflation for a while, it could have, could have a deleterious effect on the desire for people to hold and use the dollar internationally because you would show that you were a very poor long-run guardian of monetary stability. Uh, it could be very inflationary in commodity prices, and you're already seeing large powers like uh, Saudi Arabia getting together with Iran under Chinese auspices, leaning towards Russia, and all starting to talk about openly, how can we shift to a multi-currency global system? And the answer is not easily. And historically, not without war, but these questions are being asked. And if you then undermine the credibility of the dollar, what's to stop people holding onto a cargo full of iron ore or, or a tanker full of oil and saying, we'll treat that as money at the base of our collateral pyramid internationally, rather than a euro dollar, which is an offshore US dollar. So to cut a long story short, from the US perspective, I think the only way to deal with their trilemma is to raise rates aggressively, which they have been doing, is to then step into their market to make sure that higher rates don't blow up their banks which is what you've been seeing this week by you know, suspending mark-to-market accounting and other liquidity injections. Uh, and then to have a strong dollar pushing down commodity prices and trying to suck capital out of any potential geopolitical rival. And Australia obviously is only a bit part player in that, but you're on very much one side of that argument. And that one side of that argument, as uh, Paul Keating said, is to bolster American hegemony in Asia. Which... Yeah, if you, want to, if you want to put it like that, absolutely. I mean, there are lots of other ways we can dress it up. There are lots of more neutral ways we can try and make exactly the same point. And I, you know, I, I, I would argue that we really do need to. But the, the primary point is that, yeah, that's how the Chinese will see it. And you want, you know, one has to see things how, how they see things. Well, Michael, thank you very much again for your time. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Today's podcast is brought to you by multi-award winning law firm McDonald Legal, experts in the areas of dispute resolution and commercial and property law. For a free consultation on your legal matter, McDonald Legal can be reached on 03 9070 or by visiting the website www.mcdonaldlegal.com.au. So what's happening in the news? Well, World Bank research has warned that the global economy is in danger of suffering a lost decade of growth. That would be even more severe if the current financial turmoil sparked a global recession. The international organisation has warned that the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine was set to create lasting damage to economic performance. This would undermine efforts to improve global living standards, reduce poverty and address climate change. World Bank research showed that recent setbacks to the world economy had had more lasting effects and would reduce gross rates this, this, this decade by a third compared with the first 10 years of this century. Indemit Gill, the world's bank chief economist, said the fall in the level of sustainable growth was caused by less work less investment and less trade than in the more rapid periods of growth and development in the 1990s and 2000s. The bank forecasts that the growth rate the global economy would sustain this decade would be only 2.2% a year for the rest of this decade, down from annual rates of 2.6% between 2011 and 2021, and 3.5% in the first decade of this century. The research showed that the pandemic created huge uncertainties for companies and lowered investment growth rates in the world to an annual rate of 3.5%, half a level of the past two decades. It also has harmed children's education, which in turn hit workplace skills and left fewer people working than had been expected across a large number of countries. Russia's invasion of Ukraine increased uncertainties and reduced investment further, especially in Europe, the World Bank said. Geopolitical tensions since 2010 
had left global trade barely growing as fast as the world economy. And Elon Musk's very public US $44 billion, that's Aussie $66 billion takeover of Twitter, prompted major advertisers to abandon the platform in droves, with new figures showing a 46% drop in Australian ad revenue in the final quarter of 2022, compared to the previous year. Data from Standard Media Index, which measures how much media agencies are spending with different platforms, reveals Twitter's ad revenue in Australia fell from 7.3 million in the last three months of 2021 to 3.9 million over the same period in 2022. Mr. Musk became owner and chief executive of a social platform in October. This fall was despite the social media category, the broader market including Facebook, Instagram and Snapchat, for example, rising 4%. And Australian retail sales were subdued in February, adding to evidence that household spending is beginning to slow in response to higher interest rates and cost of living pressures. Sales advanced 0.2% from a month earlier, matching forecasts Australian Bureau of Statistics data showed on Tuesday. The result points to a levelling out of spending after a 1.8% surge in January and a 3.9% plunge in December. And an American company paid controversial consulting firm Synergy 360 to gain behind-the-scenes support from Liberal MP Stuart Robert to lobby a parliamentary committee that oversees a key anti-corruption agency in the hope that it would back the US firm's technology. Leaked emails reveal that Unisys paid Synergy 360, owned by Robert's close friends David Millo and political fundraiser John Marjorison, in return for Robert helping the US firm pitch its line-site border security program to the federal MPs and senators. The new details come after Government Services Minister Bill Shorten challenged Robert in Parliament on Monday to explain potential conflicts of interest in federal contracts linked to Synergy 360 and worth $374 million. Robert hit back by saying the claims against him were wrong and that a new report into the deals had found there was no clear misconduct in any of the federal con contracts. The government is seeking a further investigation into 19 deals that raised particular concerns. The reports made public last Friday did not have the scope to consider the behaviour of ministers or their advisers. The emails uncovered shed new light on the work done by Milo and Synergy 360 to, help, to seek help from Robert on behalf of Unisys in 2017, when Robert was a Liberal backbencher. The help offered to Unisys preceded many of the Services Australia and National Disability Insurance Agency contracts awarded to companies linked to Synergy 360 that were examined in government reports published on Friday. Robert returned to the Federal Ministry in August 2018 and was promoted to the Cabinet and Government Services portfolio in May 2019. Unisys pitched its Linesight technology to the Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, or ACLEI, in November 2017, after Robert, a member of the committee, proposed to the group of MPs and Senators here from the company. And the Reserve Bank of Australia Review is poised to recommend shaking up the board and the Governor devolved powers to other ABA directors who would formally take on more responsibilities beyond setting interest rates. The three reviewers are due to hand their report by this Friday to Treasurer Jim Chalmers, who will release the findings and initial government response before the federal budget on May the 9th. In July, Dr Chalmers commissioned the first independent review of the bank since its arrangements were instituted in the early 1990s, including looking into the inflation target, monetary tools, board structure, accountability, public communications and culture. He has discussed with the three reviewers how to improve publicly examining interest rate decisions after its errant guidance that interest rates were unlikely to rise before 2024, raising the possibility of the central bank scheduling regular news conferences or speeches after monthly meetings. The review has publicly and privately canvassed two options for the future board structure. One option is a specialist monetary board policy board of economic experts, complemented by a separate governance board overseeing operational matters such as a bank's internal finance, risk management, technology and human resource functions. The Bank of Canada and Bank of England have similar dual boards. The other option, which would be easier to secure bipartisan support for and not require major legislation, is a more formal selection process of members to the existing RBA board to ensure it has the best mix of skills across the economics, financial markets and labour markets. Under either potential board model, the governance power would be diluted to share responsibility with board members for oversight of the RBA's operations beyond setting interest rates monthly. The Reserve Bank Act says that the Governor manages the bank and the board is responsible for the bank's policies. In practice, board members have typically taken a narrow view of their duties and have mainly focused on setting interest rates, plus approving the bank's financial accounts and limited oversight of work health and safety reports. Currently, seven of the nine RBA board members, outside of a Governor and Deputy Governor, have little involvement in the bank's budget, projects, risk management and technology systems.
The Governor of the day, currently Philip Lowe, typically manages these areas with, with the close support of the Deputy Governor, who is heavily involved in the day-to-day -day internal operations of the bank in a role similar to a Chief Operating Officer at a big company. An on-demand food deliverer menu log will push for the Federal Government's upcoming gig economy laws to give couriers a viable path to employment, with a Transport Workers Union committing to ensure the option is flexible enough to compete with independent contracting. Menu log and the TWU have signed a Charter of Principles that supports giving the Fair Work Commission powers to set standards for delivery contractors while committing to good faith talks to reach its consensus on a sustainable employment offer for the industry. An ANZ Chief Executive Shane Elliott has warned households and businesses will have to pay more to access bank credit as a perfect storm of higher interest rates and overseas banking turmoil hits money markets. Amid the turbulence that toppled Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse had further to play out, he said. It's clearly not over, Mr Elliott said. I don't think you can sit here and say, well, that's all done, Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, and you know life will go back to normal. These things tend to roll through over a long period of time. History says it will take many, many months, if not a year, for these things to roll through the economy. The chief executive's government comments were made as Deutsche Bank's share price on Friday night forced German Chancellor Olaf Scholz to reject suggestions for the solvency of the country's biggest bank was at risk. Deutsche shares closed down 8.54 euro after falling 14% during the day, third day of sharp losses. The cost to insure against its default using credit default swaps soared to the highest level since 2020. The ripples spread through European banking stocks, reigniting fears about the potential for a widening banking crisis. Mr Elliott said while the crises that hit SVP, Signature Bank and Credit Suisse were a shock, we shouldn't be surprised. It's too early to call it. I mean, it's a crisis for some, obviously, but is it a financial crisis? Who knows? He told ANZ's Blue Notes. Does it have the potential to be one? Yes, it does have the potential to be one. And criminals are turning to artificial intelligence, machine learning and chatbots as they ramp up scam and fraud fraudulent activity against consumers and bank customers with unprecedented speed, volume and methods of attack. That's the view of Biocatch's Asia-Pacific Sales Vice President Richard Booth, who has observed scam and fraud threats towards bank customers reaching a new level. The ingenuity, the creativity to try and scam people out of their money, I think is unprecedented, and the velocity, the speed at which a fraud is taking place, he said, is definitely a bigger problem than I've ever seen the industry have to tackle. Biocatch is a behavioural biometrics firm founded in 2011 that analyses physical and digital behaviour to identify and prevent fraud and potential scam-related activity. It counts 11 Australian banks as customers, including Suncor, ANZ and National Australia Bank. Mr Boo's comments come as trust in banks has been dented by a handful of collapses offshore this month. They also align with a sharp increase in scams reported to the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, banks and the government in the past two years. The competition regulator said there were $2 billion in combined losses reported to Scamwatch, the government and the financial sector in 2021. In November, it estimated 2022's combined losses swelled to $4 billion, given the prevalence in scams through last year. And the March cyber attack on Latitude Financial was at least 42 times bigger than initially reported and is now one of the largest reported data breaches in Australian history. Belinda said Monday it had now established that 7.9 million driver licence numbers of Australian and New Zealand customers and applicants have been stolen in the attack, 3.2 million of which were supplied in the last decade. An additional 53,000 passport numbers were stolen and fewer than 100 customers had a monthly financial statement stolen, Latitude said in a statement on Monday. Latitude said another 6.1 million records were stolen in the attack, most of which were more than a decade old. Those records included the name, address, telephone number and date of birth of customers, but none included all of those details. The size of the data breach now eclipses that of the Medibank private breach in October, when the insurer failed to secure the personal information belonging to 9.7 million current and former customers. And Crown has been hit with a ransom demand by a Russian cyber gang that claims to have hacked Australian gambling giant. The company has confirmed it is investigating a potential data breach after the ransomware gang C10P posted on the dark web that had accessed the company's data. The University of Melbourne also confirmed it may have fallen victim to the gang, although any data loss was limited to cost codes which track expenditure and did not contain any personal sensitive data. The companies appear to be one of at least 130 firms comprised by C10P, which exploited weakness in the third-party Go Anywhere file transfer software a number of large companies use. The mass data breach occurred in late January and affected companies including Rio Tinto in Australia and global conglomerate Procter & Gamble. And Origin Energy has signed an $18.7 billion takeover deal with Suter's Brookfield Asset Management and Mid-Ocean Energy after months of talk and pledged to build a giant 14 gigawatts of new renewable and storage generation in Australia over the next decade. The Australian Power and Gas Giant said it had entered into a binding scheme implementation deed with investors to receive $8.912 
as a share, split between $5.78 a share and US $2.19 a share. The deal, the fourth offered by the consortium since the talks started in August, includes a plan for Brookfield to invest an extra $20 billion in origin through to 2020 to build up to 14 gigawatts of new renewable and generation and storage facility in Australia. The proposed investment in new renewables represents one-fifth of the total utility-scale renewable capacity required to be developed across the national electricity market through to 2020. As the energy transformation gathers pace, what's needed is increasingly clear, faster deployment of large-scale renewables, the accelerated responsible retirement of coal generation, and an interim supported role for gas as the dependable backup fuel, Brookfield Asset Management Chair Mark Carney said. Brookfield is determined that the new Rotogen energy markets will lead the way in all respects of this critical moment for the Australian economy. Consortium said the level of spending was expected to enable the retirement of one of Australia's largest coal-fired power generation plants, Erery, and will be undertaken with the highest regard for network reliability and security. Companies including Origin face a thorny task as they work to wind down co- giant coal-fired generation plants and accelerate a switch to clean energy amid historically high wholesale electricity prices. The incoming Mins government in New South Wales has already signalled it will begin urgent negotiations with Origin to keep the Erery power station open past its scheduled close date in August 2025. New South Wales Premier-designate Christopher Mins has acknowledged that the government might have to buy back air ring, saying taxpayers have been fleeced by its sale. A new forecast show the rapidly expanding NDIS is poised to blow a $5.7 billion hole in Jim Chalmers' second budget, with almost 200 Australians joining the program each day, and participant numbers have stripping projections released only months ago. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is one of the largest sources of pressure on the federal government's bottom line. The October budget revealed the scheme's cost is growing at a faster rate than any other area of spending outside of interest on the national debt. Federal and state governments will spend $35.5 billion dollars on the NDIS in 2022-23, which includes 34 billion in participant costs and additional expenses associated with the administration of the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, making the decade-old scheme more expensive than Medicare. About 585,000 Australians are NDIS participants, including 10% of boys aged between 5 and 7. About 6,000 people are joining the scheme every month. Monthly spending data released last week covering the period of February 2023 showed the cost of the NDIS is on track to again exceed its budget. Hassan Noura, a former official with the NDIA, said the former monthly figures compiled by the agency suggest the program could exceed its $34 billion participant support budget by $0.7 billion in 2022-23 financial year. Since higher spending carries into future years, he projects spending has blown out by $3.2 billion over the four-year forward estimate relative to the October budget. The forecast is an average of a linear and logarithmic expor- extrapolation of spending data. And Woolworths has axed 51 local jobs in its exports business, which is expected to be closed by June 30, after difficulties regaining momentum following the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The nation's largest supermarket retailer was shipping own brand products, some fresh food items and small volumes of meat to wholesale partners in key markets of Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia and the Philippines. It also sells in other countries. Woolworths International is part of B2B Food, a division of Woolworths Australian B2B Business. A Woolworths spokesman confirmed the closure and said it was flagged internally to the team in February. The closure is expected to be complete by June 30. While we have built a business partnering with other with major retailers and distributors, in overseas markets. Ongoing geopolitical issues, COVID-19 and supply chain disruptions materially impacted the business, he said. The closure of Woolworths International means 51 staff will go, predominantly in Australia, and staff have already been offered jobs in other areas or redundancies. Woolworths standalone red meat wholesale business known as Greenstock remains in place and still operates within the B2B food unit. The export business is challenging the wider grocery sector. After a decade, British retailer Tesco abandoned its own brand exports in 2021 due to poor performance, lack of of stock availability and compromised supply chain. Sainsbury's follows last year. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Telstra's cybersecurity expert Darren Pawley on how Australians can protect themselves from cybercrime. And I'll be talking to Comsec economist Craig James about what to expect in the market next week. This show was brought to you by multi-award winning law firm McDonnell Legal, experts in the areas of dispute resolution, commercial and property law. For a free consultation on your legal matter, McDonnell Legal can be reached on 03 9070 or by visiting the website www www.mcdonaldlegal.com.au In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business on the Apple Podcast Store or on my website, leongetler.com. Wishing you all-